Hi and welcome to video 1.1 of pre-calculus where we will be covering five topics, introductions of polynomials, so kind of like what is a polynomial, how do we classify it, some vocab words, some standard form, and basic operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. We'll also cover quickly domain and range of a polynomial. We'll focus a little bit on the calculator side, actually looking at it, um, and we'll also talk about how to solve it algebraically. We will find the what an inverse of a polynomial is, we will find its domain and range, and then we'll show you how to verify it using a composition. So first and foremost, let's do a little bit of vocab. So let's classify. So we've got this 2x plus 1. We have 17x squared plus 11. We have 8x cubed plus 2x squared plus 3x minus 7. And there could be so many other examples. But here we want to know, is it a monomial, a binomial, a trinomial, a polynomial? or a constant. So really quickly, if we look at polynomials versus constant, polynomial will have monomials, binomials, trinomials. Then we'll also have what's called a linear polynomial, quadratic, cubic, et cetera, et cetera. A constant is simply where my degree of the variable must be equal to zero. So in this instance, we have an x to the zeroth power. And you should know at this point, anything to the zeroth power is automatically equal to one. So if I had some constant, if I had some function that was equal to seven, technically, we could tack on that x to the zero with value because that's just a one okay and so that means anytime you have that function it's that degree power of zero that's technically what they're saying um, but let's actually go ahead and talk about what we have here so if we're talking about monomials binomials and trinomials that's the number of terms so if you look at that ax squared plus bx plus c standard kind of quadratic expression that you guys are used to how many terms are there well there's one two and three. So I ask myself, how many terms are in this? One, two. Very cool. So there's two terms. Is it some sort of polynomial? Absolutely. It is some sort of polynomial. Um, it has two X, so it must be a binomial. Technically, even a um, a monomial would include, you know, even the number six, the constant. But here we're just going to go ahead and say this is a binomial because I know it's two terms. Here again, 17x squared um, plus 11. It is a binomial because it is two terms. It doesn't matter about this degree. It is the fact that it's two terms. So here, how many terms do I have? One, two, three, four. Since it's four, it's not a binomial. A monomial is not a binomial. It's not a trinomial. So it's some sort of polynomial. Okay. Briefly, let's talk about those other vocab words. I mentioned here this is 2x to the first power degree of 1 since it's degree of 1 this is what we call a linear polynomial you should know this by now you kind of know it as that y equals mx plus b this is degree power 2 so we call this a quadratic polynomial again you should probably know this the highest power here is x cubed and so this is what we call a cubic polynomial Moving forward, let's talk about the standard form of a polynomial. You already kind of recognize it in this ax squared plus bx plus c. But any polynomial written in standard form starts at the highest degree and moves to the lowest degree. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to see it in that form. It just means that that's what we call standard form. You want to take it from its highest to its lowest and combine any degrees that are the same. So if I look at x cubed minus 11, 11x squared, so that's 3 and then 2, great. It's in standard form. Nothing can combine and it's in order. All right. And so then let's look at 2 plus 3x plus 4x squared plus 3x cubed. Awesome. So it's in an order, but it's in the wrong order. It's in ascending and it should be descending. So 3x cubed plus 4 x squared plus 3x plus 2. Now it's in standard form. Negative 3x plus 17x to the fourth plus 2x squared. Let's fix it. 17x to the fourth plus 2x squared minus 3x. Okay, here again, nothing can combine. So this becomes 2x squared plus 3x minus 1. Very briefly, what if I wrote this? Uh, I'm just making this up off the top of my head. Um, What would I do? First and foremost, I would combine these. So this is just a combination question I'm showing you. So it becomes 19x to the fourth minus 3x cubed plus 7. And again, I just made that up off the top of my head. All righty, moving forward, adding polynomials, only combining those are that are alike. So again, this is that brief thing I just showed you, 17x to the fourth and 2x to the fourth had the same degree. This is what we mean by things that are alike. In a polynomial, the only things that are alike have the same degree. So here I have 14x plus 5 plus 10x plus 5. So the same degree here is x to the first. The same degree here is technically x to the zeroth. So I can combine 14x and 10x. That becomes 24x. I can combine 5 
5 and 5, and that becomes 10. Let's do it again. 12 and 20, 0 degrees, so that becomes 32. 10x, 6x, first degree, so that becomes 16x. Okay, let's do it again. 11 and 11 becomes 22. 17x squared, 8x squared, degree 2, both of them. So that becomes 17 plus 8. Uh, I'm doing some bad math in my head. So that becomes, what, 13? Okay. Here, they didn't put it in that uh, vertical format that you might be used to. It becomes in that horizontal format. And so here I just look. Do I have x squared? x squared. Cool. So 19 and 17 becomes 26x squared. Then we have an x to the first power, x to the first power, this becomes 22x. We have an uh, x to the zero with power, x to the zero power, or that degree zero, and so then this becomes 25, and so on and so forth. See if you could attempt this one on your own. All right, let's subtract. Okay, so again, same degree, same degree, so I'm allowed to do that. 14 minus a positive 5 becomes 9. 6 minus a negative 9 here, or sorry, 6 minus 9 becomes a negative 3x. So please, please, please watch your negatives. 12 minus 4 becomes 8. 13 minus 20 becomes negative 7x. 14 minus 7 becomes positive 7x squared. Again, I verified that my degrees were the same. So go ahead and hopefully try this one on your own. You're going to try this one on your own, and I'm going to do this one that's side by side. 17 minus a negative becomes positive. You should, hopefully you know this by now. 17 plus 6. becomes positive 23x squared. 7 minus negative 5 becomes positive 12x. Negative 14 minus negative 18. Okay, so that becomes negative 14 plus 18. So that still ends up being positive 4. I think I did my math okay there. Meh. But attempt the other two just to get a little bit of practice, just kind of get ourselves back in there. How do we multiply monomials? So here you don't need like terms. What you need are the variables that are going to be the same, then their degrees can combine. Variables that are not the same, their degrees cannot combine. So if you have a multivariable polynomial, you can't just put x times y and make it x to the y or something funky. It simply simplifies to x times y. It just stays how it is. But 2x times 4x squared, we can do something. Just a reminder about exponential rules. If I have a to some b, times a to some c. Okay, so this is a component of exponent, sorry, uh, sorry, properties of exponent, and you have to have the same base. In this instance, it's all x's. You have to have the same base. When you multiply exponents, you're actually adding their exponents. When you divide exponents, you're actually subtracting top minus bottom. And then the only time you actually are going to multiply that is if it was a to the b to the c, then this becomes a to the b times c. So just for a brief reminder about properties of exponents, so then 2x times 4x squared becomes 2 times 4, so 8, and then x times x squared becomes x to the first plus that 1 plus 2, so the x cubed. And again, you can, you can kind of do that in your head if you're like, okay, if I had a single x and then I had two x's, becomes three. If I had two x's and I had five x's, it becomes seven. So you can kind of see where that goes. 17 times two is 34 x to the seventh. Again, I added these. Uh, negative 12 x to the fifth. And then hopefully you can do 26 on your own. Uh, using that distributive property, they reminded you that some people call that the rainbow. You're simply going to take this 4 and you're going to distribute it. When would this not happen? Well, if there was an exponent on the outside of that parenthesis. So if this said 4 times x plus 2 squared, you cannot go ahead and distribute that 4 because you have to deal with the exponent first. So this becomes 4x plus 8. This becomes negative 6x squared minus 3, 6x squared plus 12x plus 42, and I want you to go ahead and try number 30. Using the division, we are going to simplify. So this is that butterfly or heart or whatever you want to kind of call it. This is technically um, the opposite of adding fractions, okay? So that's kind of the easiest way I can define that. But what we're going to do is we're going to butterfly that. So that becomes negative 15 x over 5 plus 10 over 5. Okay, so this becomes negative 3x plus 2. 
All right, let's do this one. This becomes 6x squared over 2 plus 10 over 2, which becomes 3x squared plus 5. And I want you to try 35. All right, moving forward to domain and range of polynomials. We might have to use a calculator in this instance. I have desmos.com pulled up. Just a brief reminder about some information on domains. You'll kind of pick up on it as I go through it, but if you wanted to pause and look through this, you're welcome to. Ah, so I wanted to go straight to the schmoo practice. Uh oh, no, that's not correct. I don't want that. That's for later. Uh, okay, so let's just imagine something. Let's just make something up. So if I had 3x squared plus, I don't know, 7x minus 2. Sure. Okay. So if I have 3x squared plus 7x minus 2, what does it tell us that the domain of all polynomial and exponential functions is automatically R? So I already know that my domain must be R, all real numbers. Or you could, I guess if you were doing set builder notation, you could also say it went from negative infinity, uh, less than x, less than positive infinity, a couple different ways, or you could show case, or you could show it um, as set negative infinity to positive infinity. You would never use the brackets on infinities because that implies you're including infinity. And since infinite is not exactly a singular point, you can't technically include it. You are approaching those infinities. So we will say that we are approaching them. Um, and so let's say we've got this. We know our domain and our range. You could either plot it out. You could pick some XY points and you could kind of find where those max and mins were. Or we could go straight to the graphing calculator. The biggest thing here to recognize is what is our domain and range. I don't know what I made up. Okay. What is our domain and what is our range? Domain is our x's, our possible x values, and our range, and as you can see, our domain clearly extends to infinity. So it's going to be from negative infinity to positive infinity, and there's no funky points. That's the biggest part about domain. Is there an x on bottom? Is there a root function, et cetera, et cetera? Then you got to stop and ask yourself some questions. With range, as you can see, all we needed was that minimum value. So our minimum y value was negative 6.083, so that would be my lower range and my upper range as you can see goes all the way up to infinity so it would be that upper range of infinity so very briefly that's domain and range and that's really all i kind of need you to understand is polynomials most functions domains range they might be approaching infinity they might have a ceasing point in a polynomial you tend to have at least one of your range points i'm um, sorry an even polynomial you tend to have one of your range points to find but if you're looking at odd polynomials looking at that cubic function your range is going to go from negative infinity to positive infinity or vice versa, depending on whether it's a positive or a negative. So again, as we start looking at polynomial functions, you'll start to kind of pick up on their characteristics. This was just a brief introduction. So let's talk about an inverse. What is an inverse uh, and how do we figure it out? So to figure this out, I have to have you remind, remember the concept of solving, which is to isolate a variable. As I saw you guys um, practice some work last week, I noticed that some of our solves tended to be a guess and a check. And that's fine for this simplicity solves. But as we get into harder things, we kind of have to understand what is the purpose of solving? How do we isolate? What is the process? So the easiest way I can explain this to you is if you look at your order of operations, you guys learned it as PEMDAS. When we go forward, when we start with parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, we tend to be evaluating. Okay, that means you might be plugging in something, you might just be solving the question in general, and when we say solving, like we're saying evaluating. But when we solve for, when we isolate a variable, you're technically talking about going backwards. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with the addition subtraction. Once all addition subtractions are taken care of, you move on to multiplication, division, exponents, parentheses, etc. So the simplest way I can show you is that example we did. I think it looked like this. I'm not 100% sure, but let's just go with it. So addition subtraction is where I would actually start. I wouldn't start with parentheses or exponents or multiplication division. So do I see an addition subtraction? I sure do. What's the opposite of subtracting seven? I add seven to both sides because it's balancing. You must continue to balance. So this becomes 17. And this now has a new expression. 3n is equal to 17. So again, I ask myself, do I see addition subtraction? No. So I move to multiplication division. Do I see that? Absolutely. Three times n. What's the opposite of multiplication? Division of three, division of three. So in this instance, n would be equal to 17 over three or whatever that is going to be equal to a little less than six, right? Or a little over five, kind of however you want to see that. So 
that's the simplest version of solving and we're going to do that a lot right now so i want to make sure we kind of recognize that this is not a guess and check you have to go through the motions okay vertical and horizontal line test so if i have some sort of graph whatever okay so my vertical line test is obviously kind of exactly what it sounds like it's going to be vertical lines that you draw straight down so if i can draw these lines straight down and if i only touch the graph one time then the vertical line test tells me this is a function if I do the horizontal line test, this tells me whether or not a true inverse could occur. Because for a true inverse to happen, you need that phrase one to one. For every x, there is one y. For every y, there is one x. So that's a true inverse. For It's a one to one, okay? Um, you can have partial inverses with domain restrictions, and I'll show you what I mean when we get to the Schmoop example. But first and foremost, let's find the inverse of each relation. So we have these plot points. What would be the inverse of one comma negative three? It might seem very simplistic, but the answer really is negative three comma one. And then here it becomes three comma negative two. As you notice, the negatives track with that original number. It does not stay in the coordinate spot. Okay, and then one comma five, uh, four comma six. And when you plot these points, you would end up with the graph if you turned it on its side. That's exactly, that's kind of what we're doing with that inverse. We're turning it on its side, okay? Hopefully you can kind of practice number two. It should feel easy peasy, kind of common sensey. Hopefully, if you have questions, make a note. Find an equation for the inverse of each of the following relations. Okay, so y is equal to 3x plus 2, y is equal to negative 5x minus 7, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we find those inverses? If you started to notice, what are we switching around? I gave you an x and a y, and all you did was flip it and make it a y and an x. So guess what we're going to do here? I have a y and I have an x. We are going to flip them around. We are going to inverse, invert them, I guess, okay, you know, kind of get that concept going. So if I have y is equal to 3x plus 2, if I want to find the equation of the inverse, I simply switch those variables. This now becomes x is equal to 3y plus 2. But now I want to solve for y, and this is where that PEMDAS comes into place. So I'm going to do PEMDAS backwards. So I'm going to start with addition subtraction. I sure do see addition, so the opposite becomes subtraction. So this becomes x minus 2 is equal to 3y. Again, I look for addition subtraction. Well, there is a subtraction, but I just did that, so I probably don't want to touch it again. So is there a multiplication division? There sure is. Divide by 3, divide by 3. Do I have y by itself? I sure do. That's the equation of the inverse. It's that simple. I really do promise. It's that simple. So let me do number 4. If y is equal to negative 5x minus 7, let's switch them. x is now equal to negative 5y minus 7. Let's move that 7 over. So I add 7. Why did I start there? PEMDAS tells me to start with addition, subtraction, when I am isolating a variable. In this instance, I'm isolating the letter y. So this now becomes plus 7. x plus 7 is equal to negative 5y. I look for addition subtraction. There's only the one I just did. So now I look for multiplication division. There sure is a negative 5. I can divide away. And now I have x plus 7 is uh, over negative 5 is equal to y. And there is the inverse for number 4. I'm going to do number 5. Actually, number 5 I think you can do. Number six, I think you can do. And number eight, you're going to do because I'm going to do seven because I know you're looking at that um, fraction and you're like, wait a second. You want me to do that by myself? Okay, so let me show you. So y is equal to two-thirds x minus five. So let's flip those variables. x is equal to two-thirds times y minus five. Let's move that minus five. Let's make it an addition of five. This becomes x plus 5 is equal to 2 thirds y. And here's the part where I can see a couple kids kind of forgetting. How do I deal with that fraction? How do I remove that fraction? Remember, to remove a fraction, it's as simple as multiplying by the reciprocal. So 2 thirds reciprocal is its flip, which is 3 halves. So I'm going to multiply by 3 halves on both sides. And when I multiply by 3 halves on this side, I have to make sure to put it in parentheses because there's two terms on the left-hand side. So this becomes 3 halves times x plus 5 is equal to y because these threes and this two would cross out I could distribute absolutely and this be you know that would become whatever that is I don't know three halves x plus 15 halves is equal to y and there is our formula it's that simple all right, so the domain and range of a polynomial inverse. So here is where I kind of wanted to go to that schmoop exercise wherever it is 
Okay, so this is exercise 1.4's problem set. I know it might be a little hard to see, but you have access to this in your schmoop. The inverse of this function would also be a function. Okay, well, would it? The easiest thing to do there is check the vertical and horizontal line test. So this is a function. I know because if I drew vertical lines, it goes and it's great. But what about the horizontal line test? Oof, I'm hitting them more than once. Because I'm hitting them more than once, then there's no way that this can be a true function if I invert it. So I'm going to say it's false. Number two, the two functions f of x and g of x are inverses of each other. Which of the following is equivalent to the range of g of x? So this is, to me, the most important question. If I have a function who has some sort of domain and has some sort of range. But what happens when I turn it on its side? If I turn it on its side, then the domain becomes the range and the range becomes the domain. So what is the relationship of the function to the inverse? The function's domain is the inverse's range. The function's range is the inverse's domain. If it's a true inverse, if there is a true one-to-one, -one, this should always be a true statement. So the range of g of x must be the domain of f of x. It's that simple. Hopefully, hopefully now that I've explained it, it makes more sense. Which of the graphs does not have an inverse? So if I drew the vertical line test, this is a function. Cool, what if I draw the horizontal line test? I only hit it one time, so this has a true inverse. Okay, let's do it again. Vertical line test. So this has a function. So the, sorry, this is a function. So it probably might have an inverse. So let's do the horizontal line test. I hit it one time each time. That means there's a function and the function has a true inverse. All right, vertical line test. I only hit one time. It's a function. Horizontal line test. This is not a true inverse. It's not a true one-to-one. -one. So I'm going to say that D is the wrong answer. Which of the graphs is not a one-to-one -one function? Again, the first thing I'm going to do is test that vertical line test. It's not asking about the inverse anymore. It's asking about the actual function. So vertical line test, we got lucky. B is the answer. I hit more than one time. It's that simple. There is, for every X value, there are multiple Ys. That is not a one-to-one. -one. If I check my work on C, if I did vertical lines, one if I check my work on D, if I did vertical lines, I hit one time. So I know those are the right answers. If a function has a point 3, negative 5, and 6, negative 5 on its graph, which of the following says it inverse? And really quickly, I want to note that they are using inverse notation. That's how you would denote an inverse function, inverse of the function. So just want to quickly note, show that. Would, which of the following would it, it point, uh, pass through? So if you know 3, negative 5, then the inverse must pass through negative 5, comma 3. If you know 6, negative 5, then the inverse must pass through negative 5, comma 6. And there's the answer right there. That's all you could ever know. They give you no other information. So if that wasn't one of the answers, then it's got to be none of the above. Using the same function from above, from number 5, which of the following must be true? The inverse is not a function. Okay, well, how would I know? It would not have a one-to-one. -one. So let's check that point right here that we said must be true. Let's look at it. I have x is negative 5, and I have another x at negative 5. So that means for those x's, there are two different y values. So the inverse can't be a true inverse. It does not a function. So I'm going to go ahead and mark it. <laughs> Excuse me. Why doesn't the function of t of x is equal to x to the fourth have an inverse. Okay, so it, one of the answers is trick. It does have an inverse. So if I actually graphed x to the fourth, I can kind of see what they're talking about. So I'm looking at it and I'm like, hey, but it's a one-to-one, -one, right? I can pass that vertical line test, but is it? If I do the horizontal line test, how many times am I hitting that function? I'm hitting it more than one. And in fact, for every x value I have, Sorry, for every y value, I have two x values, and we can check that. At 2, there is an x value and an x value. At 3, there is an x value and an x value, et cetera, et cetera. And so I can go ahead and claim that C is true. All we're going to do is number 8. The rest, you can kind of go by it on your own, or you can come see me if you have questions. How would we restrict the domain? To me, this is the most important question when talking about domains and ranges of an inverse. How would I make it true? So looking at this graph, if I drew the horizontal line, what's happening? Okay, I hit it once. Where does it start to repeat? 
if you picked up that it's at that zero point that the repeater is happening, then you're going to recognize that there is a purpose to restricting that domain. So let's look at our answers. It says if the domain can't equal two. Well, that doesn't really help us. There would just be a hole at that two point. So that doesn't help us. The domain can only be greater than or equal to zero. Hey, that's our boundary point, but let's check the other answers. Change domain to x can't equal to zero. Again, that doesn't really help us. That just puts a hole at the zero point and change its domain to x is greater than or equal to two. Well, that would be one of the answers. If we did x is greater than or equal to two, absolutely, you would have an inverse right there. But what's the best answer? The best answer would be greater than or equal to zero because that is where the boundary shifts. That's where the change is happening. And if you, you know, if you tested it out for yourself, you would notice that every time you took um, some negative value to the fourth, it becomes the positive value and that's why that's happening with that odd function Alrighty, moving back to my PowerPoint uh, let's finally finish with verifying so verifying I need to recall what a composition is a composition is something inside of something else so if y'all remember y'all might have done at one point f of g of x so you took the original f function and every time you saw its variable you placed the g of x function in so that was a composition if if a if f and g if functions are inverses of each other then this will always be a true statement or the opposite it doesn't matter which way you go they will cancel each other out and all you should be left with is that single linear x okay that is how you can recognize it so let's test number 19. so this we're going to do f of g of x Okay, so f is equal to x plus 6. And every time I see this x, I'm going to replace it with the entire g of x, which is equal to x minus 6. So instead of x, I'm going to write x minus 6 plus 6. So let's simplify. x minus 6 plus 6, we cancel those out. It equals x. So did this equal x? Yes. So this is a verified function. Let's do another, number 20. Let's do it the other way around. G of f of x. Does it matter? No, but I'm just showing you that it doesn't matter. So g of x is x minus 2 over 5. Every time I see that x variable in the g, so if there were multiple x's, I would do it multiple times. Every time I see that x, I'm going to replace it with the entire f of x statement, which is 5x plus 2. So this becomes 5x plus 2 minus 2 all over 5. So let's simplify. That becomes 5x plus 2 minus 2 over 5. The plus 2 minus 2 will cancel, and that becomes 5x over 5. The 5s will cancel, and that becomes x equals x. So it's a verified function. I want you to try number 22. I do want you to try number 22, but in the meantime, I'm going to do 21, and that's my final for the video. So let's do f of g of x. Again, it doesn't really matter. So every time I see this x, I'm going to replace it with this whole function. So that becomes negative 3 times negative 1 third x minus 3 minus 9, right? Okay, so then I'm going to distribute this, and that becomes negative 3 times negative 1 third x minus uh, 3 times negative 3 minus 9 is kind of on the outside. So this 3 and this 3 cancel, this negative and this negative cancel, and I'm left with x. Negative times a negative becomes positive 9 minus 9. These cancel out, and I'm simply left with an x. So 21 is verified. Attempt 22. And I think that's all I have for you. That is all I have for you. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in video 1.2.